welcome back to Heroes Next Door. Thank you all for watching us. Today we are in Westchester. We're going to be doing a 911 dispatching center. I want to know what it takes to be a call taker and a 911 dispatcher. So let's go take a look. So as I make my way into the lobby of the area, obviously we got to go through security. This is a public building, so we want to make sure that everything is safe. So I'm going to put all my belongings here. I've got an extra mic for later today. My glasses. So this area is very secure and this is open to the public. You're going to go through a security check. Obviously I went off because I still have my mic on board and the cameras, uh, but we want to make sure that the, the public is very safe. We don't know where in the building this 911 dispatcher center is uh, for security reasons and we're not going to tell you where that is. But we are going to meet up with their deputy director, uh, BJ, and he's going to walk us through. Hey Mike, hey, good BJ. morning. Good to see you brother. Thank you for you? Uh, inviting us in. Uh, we're glad to have you in. Welcome to the uh, Chester County Government Services Center and the Department of Emergency Services. Yeah, we're excited to see this. We've been, you know, a lot of our viewers are saying, hey, don't forget the 911 dispatchers and call takers. They're part of public service too. Uh, we do a lot of firehouses. We do a lot of EMS and police, but we want to get you guys on. So thank you so much for inviting us in. Absolutely. It's going to be a great day with you. Okay. I got to get some of my stuff back from security and uh, we'll, you take me around. Perfect. All right. All right, so we're making our way to your lobby because we went through the main check, but you have your own specific lobby here too, right? Yeah, we have our own space here. Uh, we're just coming into it now here in the Department of Emergency Services. Um, this is our foyer, so this is our front door. Okay. Um, you know, when folks come to visit us, come to do business uh, with county government, um, this is how they, they access us. Right. I like that you actually have a display here that has some of your guys' stuff too. You know, we always think of the firehouses that have the big displays and all their history, but you guys want to preserve history just as much as everybody else. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, some real good stuff, uh, you know, across all of our divisions within the, uh, within the department. Um, so you can see some of the old stuff from fire on this side, as well as some of the trophies that have been earned. Uh, and over here, we have some of our older technology stuff and it's, you know, it's our roots. It's where we started. It's where we came from. Uh, it's all things that we're especially proud of. Um, and it, it's, it's great to share. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's great. It, it, the technology has changed so much. I remember when I started, we started out with the MDCs down here. You Absolutely. Know, there's the little yellow screen that gives you just the basic information. And nowadays we have a laptop that gives us so much information on every call. And it's cool how that changes and improves. Absolutely. It has, uh, it, it, the, the technology has changed tenfold. And as we look to the future, like we're already evaluating the next technology. So like you, I started on the same MDC and uh, you know, the, we're on to you know, stuff now that's doing GPS tracking, um, that makes it safer for us to work um, and, and really give us a better uh, tool to offer county citizens. Yeah, I mean, even the pager systems and the radios, we go from the big bricks, you know, now we got a little bit smaller radio. It's less on my back when I put it on my Batman belt. <laughs> Works everywhere and you don't have to hold it in the air. Exactly. <laughs> All right, how do we get in to see the offices and stuff? So we're gonna uh, buzz through here okay. and we'll start over towards the 911 center. Nice that it's secure. Okay, and these are just your offices of your administrative staff, correct? Absolutely, so this is a space of, um, you, you know, uh, everyone that has job assignments within the Department of Emergency Services, uh, this is where they work. So about how many employees do you actually have in a department like this? So the communication center is uh, authorized for 72 positions. Um, every day, you know, working in here with office space, uh, I'd say we're around probably 50 to 60 office for our administrative staff. But when you talk about, um, you know, the public safety training center and, you know, a bunch of the other initiatives that we do, safety and security for, you know, our buildings and county assets after hours, uh, we're in the hundreds. Wow. Yeah. I didn't even think about all those other aspects of the 911 center. I think, you know, it's, you're just taking calls and you're, you know, you're dispatching fire and, and that's it. But you guys do a ton of different things. We, we really do. So I noticed you have a mission statement on the backboard here too. 
Uh, it's important for any organization across the board, whether you're a 911 dispatcher or a, a fire company, to have a mission and a vision, and it's cool that you guys put it up on the wall. Yeah, we did this a couple of years ago. It's something that we're super proud of, uh, and it really base plates and highlights, you know, the core values of, you know, the Department of Emergency Services. Right, and down here, you have, over here is the... Uh, fire marshals fire and marshals. hazmat are uh, behind there. We'll do some hazmat stuff later on. That'll okay. be pretty neat. Okay. Um, this section over here is currently our technology group. So, um, you know, uh, pagers, um, MDCs, the tower sites, everything that makes communications work for our first responders and, uh, you know, keeps things going for the county of Chester. Okay. Uh, one question that a lot of the viewers might have is, do you supply that to the, to the different departments? We there's, do. There's a lot of departments in Chester County. Sure. So, you know, the MDCs that we saw out front, the pagers and that kind of stuff, uh, do the companies have to buy that from you or how does that normally work? Uh, the, the County of Chester provides uh, fire pagers, radios, MDCs, uh, mobile radios for, you know, fire apparatus, for police cars, for uh, EMS units. Um, are, are all part of our package that, that gets installed by our technology group. Oh, that's awesome. You know, and the technology is always changing. You've got to have personnel for that. Absolutely. Uh, as we walk further down here, the director's over here. Okay. And is he in his office? It looks like he is. Do you mind if we stop by and say hi? Let's pop in and see what he, okay. uh, what he says. Good morning. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Nice to meet you. You as well, Bill Messerschmidt. All right. So you are the new director, I hear, I uh, for the department. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome Thank to Chester you. County. I've been in Chester County a long time, and uh, we've gone through a couple different uh, changes. So we appreciate you coming in and doing what you're doing. Uh, thank you for being here. We really appreciate the, the opportunity to show you around. Yeah. So could you tell our viewers kind of what the, the 911 Center is about, what your job is, uh, and, that, and that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so within the Department of Emergency Services here, we have a number of functions, uh, you know, most notably our 911 center, which you'll be taking a tour of today. Uh, but beyond that, you know, we have our emergency management division. Uh, we provide a number of support services to our field providers, police, fire, and EMS, and emergency management through public safety training. Uh, we have uh, a number of administrative folks that, you know, keep the, uh, keep the department going here um, and, you know, keep our services moving. We also have a safety and security division that provides safety and security for county buildings and things like that. Uh, very heavy technology division that makes sure that our radio is still working, our, our CAD system uh, is on 24-7 and really supports that back-end technology that you'll see in the 911 center. Yeah, the technology has really changed over the years. Um, it, it's amazing to me, just on my own service, on what you guys can do, how you track us, how you do status checks on us to make sure yeah. we're safe. Uh, and you know, getting the calls, the amount of information you're able to provide to me as a provider is phenomenal. 100%. Yeah. So we appreciate everything that you're doing and uh, you know, good luck in the rest of your career here. Thank you very and, much. And uh, you got an awesome department. We're gonna take another look at you know, how it actually works. Great, great. You're gonna meet a lot of great people today uh, and I'm gonna see a lot of great things in the department. So looking forward to, uh, uh, to showing you around. All right, thank cool. you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yep. All right, let's, uh, let's turn the corner here and we'll head over to the 911 Center. All right. So now we're making our way into the actual working area, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So welcome to the Chester County uh, 911 Communication Center. Uh, a little dark in here. We, we like a dark environment, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's our flavor. So what do you have actually in here? You got a ton of people working already, I see. Are the call takers and dispatchers, are they all in this room? Yeah, yep. So this is our primary communication center. We have a backup site out at uh, our uh, South Coatesville location at the Public Safety Training Center. Um, but this is where, you know, we deliver uh, 911 services to the county on a routine basis. So um, today we have 16 people working on the A platoon. Uh, so you'll see that we have supervisors, we have dedicated call takers, uh, we have our police uh, dispatch staff, and then we have our fire and EMS dispatch staff as well. This place is absolutely huge. I love that you got you know all the computers set up, and no wonder it's got to be dark in here. You got to make sure that your eyesight is good for the next 20 years as you do a career of this. That's it. It's uh you know if the overhead lights are on, then it, it really just staring at a screen all day, right. I, I think really starts to just kind of hammer the eyes. So. Um, you know, our staff prefers it and uh... so right now we're making our way into the EOC so we can talk a little bit more. I don't want to dis disrupt, you know, the guys that are going here. They're talking to people that are calling 911 that have true emergencies. Yes. So we're going to go in the EOC so we can talk a little bit more. Is that okay with you? Let's go meet Evan in the uh, operations center. All right. 
Evan, it's so nice to meet you, brother. Nice to meet you too, Mike. Yeah, thanks for inviting us in. No problem at all. I hear you're kind all. of the expert of the EOC area of this. So let's have a conversation and tell us. BJ, we'll catch up to you in a little bit. Absolutely. All right. All right. So tell us about what an EOC is. What does that stand for? So it stands for Emergency Operations Center. Okay. And how is that different from a 911 dispatching center? So the EOC is only staffed during major emergencies or during drills. Okay. An example would be if for an emergency, it would be staffed during flooding, like when we had the flooding in Downingtown, there were people in here taking phone calls, helping the citizens, directing them where to find assistance. We also use it for drills for our two nuclear power plants that are in our emergency zone. We have Limerick Generating Station in Montgomery County and we have the Peach Bottom Atomic Power Station over in York County. Okay, yeah, that's something I wouldn't think about in Chester County itself. I'm like, I don't have a, a, a station I have to worry about, but it's big enough that you guys actually pay attention to it and are ready for any emergency that comes through. Right. Now, this is a very large room with a bunch of monitors in it also. Who do you bring in for an EOC? So the EOC is staffed by our staff personnel who work in the offices. A lot of them were former 911 operators and dispatchers, or some of them are or have been fire chiefs, retired police officers, so they all have emergency experience. Okay. In the past, we talked to an EOC that was in um Indiana area. They also have places for stakeholders such as, you know, large business holders or stuff like that. Do you bring those in? Like maybe a physician or anything like that in an emergency situation? We have sometimes we do have a room which is next to actually which is the commissioner's room. The commissioners can come in and sit there, but we have contact with stakeholders on the phone. I, we usually don't bring them in here, but we could okay. in that event. Okay, so communications via phone is yes. a good way to do that. That's awesome. Another question that has been posed to us on our feeds or our comments on some of our videos is how do you guys prioritize calls? Because obviously we know, you know, a cardiac arrest is a serious call, a fire is a serious call, but we may get someone that fell or we may get someone that's sick or something like that. How do you guys prioritize those kind of calls? So it's actually pretty easy on our end because the CAD system does it for us. Every event has a different priority to it. So someone in a cardiac arrest, it's going to be a priority one call. Somebody woke up and saw their mailbox was struck by somebody, that's going to be a priority seven call. So the CAD system is going to stack the high priority calls at the top and present those to the dispatchers first before it presents non-emergency calls to them. Okay. I think the last question I had for you, Evan, is what if I accidentally call 911? What happens then? Do I get everybody or what? So if you accidentally call, the most important thing to do is do not hang up. Stay on the phone. If you stay on the phone and verify you don't have an emergency, you'll be fine. No one will show up on your doorstep. If you hang up on us, if you called from a landline, we're automatically going to send police out there to check on you. If it's a cell phone, we'll call you back and make sure there's no problem. Okay. And then you'll be on your way. So the important key is don't hang up. Let them know it was an accident. Let them know that you're okay. Uh, because otherwise, they're going to think you called and maybe got disconnected. Right, exactly. So. Awesome. I want to go back in and talk to some of your actual dispatchers and maybe some of your call takers. Do you mind if we do that? Not at all. All right, let's go do that. Okay, sounds like fun. Now we're meeting up with Mike Groover. You're a good friend of mine from yes. way back in the day. Yes. We did EMS together. Just so a little bit. You came over to uh, the 911 center a number of years ago. 1996. Years ago? Okay. I've been here 27 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So good time. you run the emergency management side of it Correct. versus the EOC. What is the difference between the two? So the EOC is part of our emergency management component. So day-to-day -day things we do, planning, uh, we work with the municipal officials to make sure their emergency operations plans are good. We work on county-wide response plans. Uh, you know, we, we coordinate a lot of the things that kind of come off the, the 911 center. So when we have large thunderstorms that roll through, large power outage, uh, we work with the 911 center and coordinate with 
the utilities, you know, Pico, PPNL, things like that, to sort of make sure their crews are out working, uh, that we're getting focused where we need. And if any of the municipalities have flooding issues, trees down, things like that, we can coordinate resources either from other municipalities or other counties to, to sort of get in and help. We either do that through our duty officer program. We have one of our team members assigned uh, 24 hours a day to, to meet those one-off calls. Or if things start to get really busy, we'll bring a few folks into the emergency operations center. Just a, a, a way to have everybody on, on, the, on the floor here talking to the folks on the ground. Uh, we also do a couple of large events. Every year we're responsible for uh, exercising with the nuclear power plants. Uh, it's another big piece of what we do. We have uh, one gentleman, uh, Tony Prashodin, who's our radiological coordinator. He sort of coordinates everything that happens with the nuclear plants, uh, and we are required the way it works out with us. We have, a, we have a plant on either side, so we do a nuclear exercise every year, which is a full activation of the EOC. We bring everybody in. We essentially go through the drill, uh, making sure that uh, we're following policies and procedures. Everything that we have is up to snuff and working, and communication goes well with the plan. Okay, so that's more of a tabletop uh, drill, or do you actually go out and physically, you know, drill like we used to going through EMT or paramedic schools? There's or different fire schools. There's different components. So we do what we call a functional exercise in the EOC, uh, and then we do a number of out of sequence events where we'll work with the the school districts. The, the emergency responders, just going through their steps of decon, and, and that's all done on a full scale. So they, they go out, they go to the parking lot they would use to set up their decon, wash some people off, prove that they can do it, and, and that all gets federally graded. Okay. So it's not just us making sure that it works, it's the, the feds coming out and saying, okay, we've looked at this and, and we can check off that Chester County knows their stuff. One of the things that I noticed on the news was there was a collapse of a bridge that went over 95 near Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. yep. What if that were to happen here in Chester County? Is this where that information would go to? And how does that work? So it would, obviously the calls would come in through the 911 center. We would uh, rapidly uh, contact our partners at PennDOT uh, and we would very likely, that would be a limited scale activation uh, of this room. So we would bring in folks from PennDOT, uh, the state, the feds, obviously everybody that got involved in, in the Philadelphia disaster. Uh, they would have uh, space here to work and allow our municipal folks to be able to coordinate, our county folks to be able to coordinate. You know, we talk about like if that had happened at Route 30. Route 30, nice big road, not quite 95. Uh, so. It might not be a 24 hour operation uh, like Philadelphia did with a lot of their things, uh, but we would definitely do, you know, whatever was necessary to coordinate detours and traffic control, things like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you have some pretty good thoroughways here. I've worked yeah. them, you know, the 202 yes. corridor, the 30 bypass corridor, you know, you have some pretty good traffic ways that feed into Philadelphia Absolutely. or down in the Delaware County and down to Baltimore. So, you know, we yeah. appreciate the, the efforts you guys put into keeping us safe. It would definitely make a couple of days exciting. That's for sure. Well, Mike, thank you so Absolutely. much for what you do here. Thank you for coming we, out, Mike. Really appreciate it. This is something that, you know, is part of the service. Mm -hmm. You know, many times we think of fire, police, and EMS, but dispatchers and 911 call takers, you guys are part of us. You're the brotherhood with us, too. So Absolutely. I want to make sure we're highlighting you guys. We appreciate it. So we have a unique opportunity to talk to one of the one, 911 call takers, and you are? Maria Mondragon. All right. Thank you for taking your time out of your day to talk to us. Uh, one of the first questions I want to know to get to know you is how did you get into the 911 service? I actually had a friend from a different department, uh, from the same department actually, but a different position, reach out and he introduced me to the job and it aligned with what I studied in college. So okay. I decided to see what it was about. Can you talk to me through about what it takes to become a uh, call taker? I, I feel like you need a, a lot of different skills. Customer service is a big one but also having a calm demeanor, knowing how to act fast and multitask for sure. As we have six different screens in front of us, we need to know how to use all of them. But um, it's just a lot of uh, skills that you can develop and skills that you have on your own. Okay, did you have to go through a training program to do that? We or did. did you learn, learn on the job or how does that work? So we, it's a little bit of both. We did do the training prior. It was about like three months and um, we did simulations where we did practice calls and like given scenarios in class and just like one-on-one -on -one with our coworkers and peers who would volunteer to come in and help us during the training process, which helped, was really helpful into getting to know who we're gonna be working with and what familiar faces are gonna be in the office. And it was, a, it was an extensive like, amount of time of training, but really useful 
We also did get the one-on-one -on -one time with our trainer while we were taking live calls, so that also helped. So one of the things that I want to know is what are some of the tools that you use to make your job successful? Okay, so as I mentioned, we do have six computer screens, and there's a variety of like technology that we use, whether it's um, like Rapid SOS and Vesta, which is our phone system, and Rapid SOS, like our GPS tracking. Rapid SOS just tracks the satellite on your cell phone, so just pinging us and showing us where you're moving as you're on the call with us. So that's one of the biggest tools that we have to our advantage. So when we get calls that are just like open line or someone just yelling help, we can at least see your location and have an officer started out there. And um, aside from the, the tools there, just like the people in the room, the management, they've all been really helpful. Thanks. So thank you for taking your time out of today and talking to us. So now I have an opportunity to talk to one of the police dispatchers here. You are? Ryan. Ryan, what's your last name, Ryan? Corkin. All right, nice to meet you. Thank nice you for you. Uh, taking your time out of your day and talking to us. No problem. So first of all, let's start out with, how did you get into becoming a dispatcher for the police department? Uh, so when I started, went through call taking and all that, I was the call taker about three and a half years. And then they decided it was time, do you want to go to police radio? So I had a few months of training over there and got released on my own and then did scope training as well. Okay, what's the difference between a police radio dispatch versus an uh, EMS dispatch? Um, police, you're more worried about traffic pursuits, officer safety, that kind of thing. Whereas EMS, you know, fire, EMS, completely different calls. Um, so mainly that type of calls you're gonna get. A lot of ours, police only calls, disturbances, domestic, stuff like that. Whereas over there, they're getting house fires, cardiac arrests. Police are still going, but just different importance levels. So what kind of training did it take for you to become this um, and, and start serving in this way? Um, so yeah, when I first applied, you know, you go through the testing, interviews, you have our training programs pretty extensive just to get on board. So it was like two to three months of in-classroom training, get released onto the floor, you train with a CTO, certified training officer for another couple of months and then you're released just as a basic call taker. And that is all in-house training or do you go to a college to get that training? In-house. In-house, okay. Yep. So you get hired in, you might be somebody that doesn't know anything. They'll yeah. start you at the basic level and they'll work your way up. Yeah. A lot like when you volunteer at a fire company, they'll come in and have no fire experience. They'll send you to fire school and stuff like that. Yeah. Is that what I'm understanding you guys also yeah. kind of do? And you got a mix. There's people here who have firefighting experience, EMS training. I had none when I started. So there's a good mix of people that come in with it and without. Okay. Well, thank you for doing what you do. We really appreciate it. Thanks for keeping us safe and giving us the resources. No problem, nice to meet you. So off camera, I was talking to some of the crew here and they told me about a position called a watch officer that I've never heard about before. And we're gonna be able to talk to Caitlin, right? Yes. Tell me your whole name, Caitlin. Caitlin Buckley. Okay, and you are the watch officer? Yes. Can, explain to me what that is. It's kind of unique. What we call it is a 24 seven all hazards watch desk officer. Um, it's essentially a liaison between the 911 center and our emergency management agency through the county. And what we do is monitor situations that are happening within the county. We have a matrix notification, which is essentially um, a list of different incidents. So when they meet a certain threshold, there needs to be different kind of notifications to internal and external um, people and employees just to let them know what's going on in the county. Okay, can you give me an example of what that might be? Sure, so say we've got a three alarm house fire um, somewhere in the county. When that call comes in, I'm watching, I'm listening to the call takers. I'm watching our computer aided dispatch system to see what the details are. Um, so three alarm once you get one, two, three, however many resources or trucks and stuff you have. Yeah. Um, we'll put out a notification to our deputy director for fire services, for example, in our um, operations team. So once we let them know what's happening, they'll see what they have to do um, on their end of things for their job. Um, we also let Pima know, our Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency. Um, another thing we do with that type of situation, that's essentially letting them know this is what's happening in the county. Um, we also would call the Red Cross if there are displaced um, families, pets, anything like that, we'll give them a call. Kind of takes the burden off the fire dispatchers to do their job. Um, so we will handle that, get them the information, they can dispatch the, their ARC team. Do all 911 centers have that, uh, this kind of position? No, this position's relatively new here in Chester County and they're not, they don't have them everywhere. Okay, so. maybe they should start. Maybe. <laughs> thank you very much, Caitlin, course, we thank appreciate you. it. Okay, Mike, so now we're gonna walk out into the 911 center and we're gonna talk to Joe Pennington 
one of our assistant shift supervisors. Awesome. Let's go do that. Hey, Joe. Nice hey, to how are you? you? Nice to meet Good. you. Good. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to kind of show us around. Yeah, no problem. There is a ton of stuff here, and uh, it, it's almost overwhelming. Can you talk me through what you do and how this all works? Sure. So I'm the assistant supervisor here um, on one of the shifts. We have four different shifts. Um, and kind of my job is to just make sure that everything's kind of going the way it needs to go. Um, answer any questions that some of our telecommunicators may have, um, you know, for things that come up. You know, this job isn't the same every day. Things change and we definitely get those out of the ordinary type of calls that come in. Um, I also kind of coordinate with our watch officer that you met earlier um, on making the notifications that we have to make internally and externally to the public when needed uh, for different things. Um, so that's that's a day-to-day -day there. Okay, can you kind of give us a tour of who, where everybody sure. is? Sure, so I'll go over, we'll go over to the call taking pod first. Okay. Uh, we have two different call taking pods. Uh, we have one over here and we have one on the other end of the room over there. So we can house up to eight call takers at a time um, in the room. Okay. We also have our backup center that can also house more dispatchers if we need to upstaff for storms and things of that nature. Okay. About how many calls do you get a year for 911? A year? Uh, well, we get we get roughly a thousand calls per day. Okay. Um, I don't know what the yearly stats are. We can do the math yeah. on that. So a thousand calls per day. That's a lot of information. Yeah. And, and so that could be anything from you know I locked my keys out of my car to to cardiac arrest calls, house fires, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, now, each of the call takers, are they assigned to a certain desk or do they come in and just pick whatever they want? No, I mean, people are creatures of habit, so they tend to stick to the same seats that they normally sit in. Um, but, it, you know, we have some people here on overtime, so they'll come in and, and sit wherever's open okay. and kind of leave seats for, you know, if this is this person's seat, Hello, then, you know, they'll sit there. Okay. And are all the consoles set up the same or do they have different yeah, features? Yes, so all the call taker consoles are set up the same. So we have the, the phone in the top left, our network computer in the bottom left, um, and then the four monitors on the right, they're kind of customizable, but it's all the CAD and mapping system. Um, it's Windows based, so people can kind of move it how they want to. Um, so some people might have their map up there, some might have their map on the bottom. It's just whatever is more comfortable for them. Okay, okay. And what else do we have here? Over here, you said there was something so, else? So over here is our fire and EMS dispatching. So we'll go over here. Real quick, what are these little lights for? So the lights, um, yellow is for when they're on the phone call, uh, green is radio, and red is if they need help. Uh, we don't use the red too much, it's because it's a lot easier just to stand up and shout, hey, I need a supervisor. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, with all these pillars here in the room, they get obstructed quite a bit, so. Yeah, right. Okay. So this is the fire dispatching system. Yes, yeah, right? so this is the fire and EMS Arrow dispatch. Tonight, so it's broken up into three different districts. You have your central, your east, and your west. Um, it's broken up that way to kind of make the, the call volume a little bit more manageable for, for one person. Um, this is Alex. He's currently dispatching the east. So that's going to be like your main line area, Berwyn. Central is going to be, um, you know, Exxon up through Phoenixville, okay. up to North Coventry. And the west is going to be Nottingham, Oxford, all the way out to Coatesville, up okay. through through that area there. Now, I know that you guys are up 24-7. You have the three channels, but today you only have two uh, dispatchers on. Yeah. Does one just kind of pick up, or do they share so the they, responsibility? They, they kind of share the responsibility. They, you know, we work really well together with each other. Um, you know, so if, if Alex over here is dispatching a call, then Kevin will pick up another call if it comes in, um, and then kind of go back and forth. Okay. to make sure that the calls are going out. Okay. Now this is separate from a police dispatcher. Sure. Okay, why is that? Um, so part of it's because um, the call volume is a lot less over here. So we probably do six to 800 police calls in a day. Um, fire EMS can be upwards of 300. Okay. So the call volume is a lot less. We don't have um, most of the time fire agencies calling out fires on the radio usually okay. we let them know what's going on okay whereas in the police radio the officers are out driving around they see things they call it on the radio um, so the so they're almost self dispatching and you're monitoring them and keeping them safe right. where this where you're actually dispatching because yeah. when I'm on the fire truck or I'm on the EMS I don't go until you call me sure so. exactly uh, so you know I mean and obviously things can change here they can go from you know 
very, very normal, right. calm time to, you know, now I got a two alarm house fire that I'm dealing with, right. you know. The one thing that I've noticed just from being in here, it's actually very, very quiet. Even though you have a lot of communications going on, it's very quiet in here, unlike an emergency room where you got bells going off and stuff like that. Is that intentional or is that just kind of your, um, the way you operate? It's kind of just the way we operate. I mean, the, we keep the lights down because we're staring at computer monitors all day, so it can kind of hurt our eyes after a while. Um, but unless, you know, it gets a little bit louder as things kind of ramp up, you know, if we get those bigger incidents. Okay. Um, but, you know, we try not to use the keyword too much. Yeah, <laughs> we, we don't use that anyway. Right, right. <laughs> awesome. Okay, what else do you have around here? So, so, so th those are the two sections, right? So, so that's uh, fire and call tech. I can take you over to police radio next. We'll okay, over there. let's go take a look at that. Sure. What are the monitors up here on the on the sides? So, so you know, working in emergency services, you know, we need to keep up on uh, things in the news. So we have different local news channels and national news channels um, playing 24/7, so that you know, if something breaking comes in, they could affect Chester County. We we have that information. We also have over here the PennDOT cameras. Uh, we have the ability to cycle through all the all the cameras in the county. Right. Uh, we don't control the actual camera, so if we need the camera moved, we'll call PennDOT and have them move it. They have okay. a camera operator. Right. Uh, but we've seen traffic pursuits, house fires, car right. fires, you name it, on, on these cameras. And sometimes we see them before we get the phone calls in, too. Okay. Um, and then we have, obviously, weather can greatly affect our, our call volume. So we're always monitoring the weather to see. Uh, we're gonna get a lot of a big storm coming through right, and get right. a lot of calls. Yeah, there's a storm coming in this afternoon. So yeah, we'll, we'll oh, get it done. Oh, it's that season. Yeah, yeah. And the traffic cams we've used, you've actually helped me locate a, a traffic accident. It came out, you know, dispatched as a certain mile marker and it wasn't there and you guys caught it on camera. Yeah, and that, and that happens quite a bit. And PennDOT will sometimes call us if they see, see okay. it. Um, so a lot of times we've had a, um, accidents in the past where PennDOT's the one calling us telling, hey, we got an accident on the, on the 30 bypass at this mile marker. All right, okay. we haven't gotten a call yet, but we'll send it up. <laughs> All right. So. <clears throat> we'll stop here. So this is the police dispatch. Yes. I like the fact that you guys have desks that actually raise up also. Yeah, so we try and uh, let our, our telecommunicators be comfortable. I mean, we're, we work 12 hour shifts, so sitting for a whole 12 hours can be unhealthy for one. Yeah. Um, so our consoles, they're able to raise and lower depending on the, the height that the, the telecommunicator wants it, whether they want to stand. Um, some people like to have their screens higher when they're sitting even. Right. Um, we have uh, heat and cooling controls in there. Okay. So, um, you know, it can get cold in here for some people. I'm, all, I'm usually always hot, so I have my <laughs> fan on most of the time. Um, and there's also console lighting. There's there's under lights underneath the monitors. There's little desk lamps over there. We have the, the can lights, as you can see, mm -hmm. over top of some of the consoles too. So it's all really customizable to, to the telecommunicator's comfort and preference okay. to make to make working That's nice, because you're, you're thinking for their comfort, for their longevity of doing a stressful job. Sure. You know, taking those calls in and dealing with stuff that you can't go and touch. You know, when I'm on a, on a truck, I can go and I can actually touch somebody and fix them and that kind of right. stuff. You guys are with me that whole time and you're getting that information. That's a ton of stress that you just can't really do anything about. Yeah. So, and a lot of times we don't get the we don't get the outcome of the calls all the time either, which, which can be stressful for some yeah. as well. So. How about we go back to your station there sure. and we'll finish up. <clears throat> So this is the supervisor area, um, centrally located in the room. Um, that way I can hear and see everything that's going on around me and, and you know get to where I need to be at to help whoever needs help during the shift. Uh, we have a lot more monitors over here. We can see all the incidents going on in the county at once and see um, how long one of our telecommunicators has been on the phone. And we also monitor all the all the radio channels in the county. Okay. Going on. Okay. So if I were to call 911, how long does it normally take to get dispatched? From the time I say, "Hey, I need help," to, compared to someone coming to get me. So so we tr we strive to, to keep it within a minute and a half from the time you call 911 to the time we get the call dispatched. A minute and a half is what, is what we strive for, and we do a really good job of doing that. Um, we we try and keep our standards 90% and above, and. Um, 
we, we do a pretty good job following that. Um, and what's nice is by the call takers taking the calls and entering, as soon as they enter it, it goes to the dispatcher and they can dispatch it while the call taker is still getting more information. So it keeps that, that process moving. Right, right. So right now I have an opportunity to sit at one of their dispatching desks. This is, a, they got everything that here. So Joe, explain to me what's going on. I almost feel a little overwhelmed as soon as I sat in the chair here. I got three different keyboards. Obviously this is my phone answering, right? And I used my headset. How do I answer a radio and a phone? So um, the, the phone's always our number one priority. You know, that's how we get the calls that we need to dispatch. So the phone's up here. Um, when the calls ring, it'll come in through our phone system and we'll get the information displayed up at the top here. We have the ability to transfer to um, different agencies or resources if we need to through here. And we also make outgoing calls to call other agencies that responders might need, whether it's PICO, PennDOT, that kind of thing. Okay. So I'm going to kind of walk my way through here, just like this is a, tr a truck for me. because So I have each keyboard controls a different section, I assume, right? Uh, I have my phone, uh, I have my different lights, but this desk is unique because I can raise uh, or lower this, correct? Yep, you, so so these this will raise the back here so you can raise the monitor up and lower it if you need to. Okay. Um, this will raise your keyboard desk up. So I can make it comfortable where I'm at for so I'm ergonomically correct. correct. I also have a foot pedal that I can use to talk on the radio, so, a lot like our fire trucks. So if we get really busy, um, you know, big incident. A lot of times it's nice to be able to just keep our hands on the keyboard and, and type in comments and, and different commands in while using our foot to, to activate our radio with our headset on. Man, this is, it makes me, I wish you guys could see this or feel what I'm feeling right now because it gives you that little anxiety a little bit. I got three different, four different, six different screens going on and all this information. Um, it, it's definitely a skill set that needs to be learned and done. So thank you, Joe, so much for doing this. Yeah, no this. problem. Thanks um, for coming this in. This is very cool to see. Uh, I think I want to set this up for my editing program for YouTube. So uh, we appreciate it. Yep, and no uh, I thank think you. we're going to meet back up with um, BJ and uh, awesome. finish this up. Sounds good. So let's go take a look. So BJ, thank you so much for taking us around. We really appreciate you and your staff that you have here. I got a couple more questions for you before we end. Kind of give me some stats of how many calls do you take? What kind of coverage area do you have? And that kind of thing. Good questions. Uh, we cover the entire county of Chester. So that's 72 municipalities. Um, you know, I like to say we do about a thousand calls for service a day. Now this afternoon, if we get some storms in, that number could go, you know, up. If we have a slower day where everyone's safe in the county, um, you know, that number goes down. Uh, typically we do, you know, I think last month we did 15,000 emergency calls for service, and then the balance of those were non-emergency calls. Wow, wow, well, we appreciate that. So the other question I have, and I ask everybody that we go to, if I wanted to become part of your service and I want to become a dispatcher or a call taker, how do I do that? We're certainly interested in that and we're getting ready to hire for that. So um, on July 24th, um, from 6 a.m., I'm sorry, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., we'll be doing a hiring event right here. Um, anybody can go to the uh, chesco.org website and begin to research that now, or just show up to uh, the Department of Emergency Services on the 24th and uh, we can get people in. And that's here at this building? That's here at this building, okay. absolutely. So if you guys are out there and you're interested, come on down on the July 24th yep. and become part of the 911 Dispatching Center. So BJ, we appreciate it once again. It's great having you in, Mike. As always, guys, thank you for watching Heroes Next Door. This was the Station Cribs with the 911 Dispatching Center for Chester County. Before we end, hit subscribe, hit notification, and keep smashing those like buttons. Also, make a bunch of comments because we appreciate it. We'll see you again next week.